Thank you, Dr. Lehman, for a nice introduction. And uh, I hope this presentation is not going to be too depressing and you'll still be able to walk uh, home in the dark uh, without fearing for your life. Um, however, that's going to be debatable. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, gun violence, which uh, all of you um, who read the newspapers and watch TV uh, know that's really become an epidemic, uh, not just in Philly, but uh, all over our country. Um, so everything really uh, started to um, get from bad to worse um, after the uh, COVID-19 shut down uh, most of our country and uh, all kinds of stressors, people losing their jobs. Um, we started seeing spikes in violence, not just domestic violence, but also gun violence. And uh, in 2021, things really didn't get any better. When I prepared this presentation a couple of weeks ago, um, the Philadelphia uh, statistics that's uh, freely available on the web showed that there was 1,898 people shot in Philadelphia. I checked this morning again, and now our numbers are 1,922 uh, people. And this is uh, mainly young adults, uh, but uh, it really uh, touches uh, 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 they, they're very young as well. We had uh, five babies that were under one years of age uh, shot uh, in Philly uh, this year. Uh, at uh, St. Christopher's Hospital, which is where I work, uh, we've seen uh, also a great spike of uh, gun violence. Uh, when I was uh, in training, um, I, we prob I've probably seen more um, gunshot wounds this year that I've seen in my training uh, years altogether. When I was a fellow, we had zero gunshot wounds uh, in uh, Silicon Valley at Stanford. And uh, you can see that this is really disproportionately affecting the poor communities. And uh, uh, in Philadelphia, the, ye the yellow arrow that you see here points that uh, this is not a 90210 zip code, this is uh, our, our St. Christopher's uh, Hospital zip, which is amongst the five zip codes that one third of these shootings uh, affect. So Philadelphia is, uh, many, has many firsts. We had the first hospital, first medical school, uh, first insurance company, uh, we've been number one in sports and now, um, you know, this is some statistics that nobody wants. We are number one in uh, murder rate uh, in the uh, capita, per capita in the country's 10 largest cities. Uh, the main uh, population affected is minorities, um, mainly young black males. Um, these are all real, real uh, headlines from news, most of them from this year. Um, the, the students are afraid to go to school. Um, babies are being used as human shields. Um, this was a, uh, a horrible um, uh, story where an 11 month old was taken in a drug deal. Dad was uh, thinking that no one's gonna shoot him if he brings the baby along while paying for drugs with fake money. And that was not the case. The baby was shot five times. Um, the chart that you see there uh, you can see that there's uh, the yellow and the, the red uh, dots. Those are all the shootings uh, in the Philly uh, uh, city lines. And the, the red ones are the, the, the uh, fatalities. Uh, so um, again, a couple of weeks ago, we had 450 fatalities out of the um, uh, nine, almost 19,000 shootings. Um, but uh, um, Again, this is uh, this is a pretty pretty much increasing every year. 2020 was significantly worse than 2019, and now in 2021, we already have a 13% increase from last year. So, what do we see? So, on the streets, uh, uh, the most common uh, weapon. I again, I, I'm not an expert in guns. I got most of my information from Google, um, but the uh, um, most common a uh, gun that's used for violence, uh, violent crimes is a, a nine millimeter semi-automatic gun. Um, the guns 
in their um, fatality rate, uh, um, potential to do damage vary from a prop gun to uh, military grade weapons, uh, AK-47s, semi-automatics. Um, but even, even with the prop gun, uh, we've seen in the news uh, recently that Alec Baldwin's movie set had a prop gun and uh, two people got hurt, one person died. So it's not so benign. They still use real gunpowder. And uh, there was another um, couple of uh, fatalities that uh, prop guns uh, uh, were responsible for. One was in the 90s, 93, I believe, with Brandon Lee, Bruce Lee's son, who was filming uh, The Crow. And uh, he was shot uh, with a um, prop gun that was not properly loaded. And uh, uh, the movie set went on until they realized that he had actually gotten shot for real and he ended up dying. Uh, there was another actor that uh, thought it was funny to joke around and uh, put blanks in the uh, prop gun and put it in his temple and fired and the blast injury killed him. This was in 84. Um, he died in the hospital a couple of days later. Pellet guns uh, are not harmless either. They can penetrate a baby's skull. Um, we see some accidental uh, uh, shootings uh, where kids get a hold of their parents' uh, uh, guns or relatives' guns and play with them and end up uh, shooting each other or themselves. Um, those are usually pretty f um, bad injuries because they close range. That's why suicides are, are very uh, lethal because they are usually uh, very close range uh, injuries. But if you have a very powerful, powerful gun, they can carry very long ranges. And we've recently seen just innocent bystanders far away driving by in their car, gotten shot and, uh, and died. So what are firearms? So that's uh, any, um, defined as any weapon that uses explosive uh, powder to charge a propel uh, or, or propel a projectile. The, the stun guns, they are real weapons. They have gunpowder, but they don't, they're supposed to be lacking that projectile. Um, the caliber uh, refers to the size of the barrel. So again, the nine millimeter being the most common one that we see. And uh, you can imagine how big a th um, an AK-47 is, um, the barrel being 35 millimeters, which is almost four times as big as uh, a nine millimeter gun. Um, Magnum gives the gun some extra power, um, and that will uh, go back to the amount of energy that that uh, weapon can deliver. There's only, uh, 213 uh, uh, feet per second that is needed to penetrate the bone. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a very powerful gun to be able to penetrate the skull. So there's a whole, um, whole uh, 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 um, physics uh, uh, arm uh, called ballistics that um, studies the uh, the projectiles and um, how the uh, projectiles enter into tissue. And uh, um, there was actually a lot of funding until the 90s uh, where the federal government uh, put a stop on all, um, all gun research for about 20 years. And not until 2019, they started funding um, this, uh, this research again. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, really um, an opportunity, I think, now for, to bring more awareness and, and uh, you know, really uh, bring a voice to what's happening uh, and what's really killing our, our kids and uh, young adults. Uh, ballistics for a neurosurgeon are unique because we are not dealing with just soft tissue. Um, there is a uh, um, really dynamic on how the bullet uh, hits the bone, and uh, in many cases, that ends up being the terminal uh, pathway for the bullet. It gets lodged into the cranial cavity. It may change uh, its 
trajectory. It propels from, you know, inside the cratium from an inner table and ends up completely in a different location from the original pathway. But in either case, it really creates havoc um, when you have a penetrating injury to the skull. And we'll see that sometimes it doesn't even have to uh, go into the skull to create uh, um, a very bad uh, injury. Different guns um, have, uh, um, the, the barrels are made to look in different ways. There are grooves that allow the gun um, bullet to uh, stay in a pathway. Those uh, are a lot more accurate than when we're talking about a shotgun that are smooth inside. You don't have to be a master shooter to be able to shoot a shotgun and hit somebody uh, because you have pretty much bullets uh, spreading everywhere. Uh, so the more the grooves, uh, the more um, accurate you have uh, your, your, your aim is. There are three mechanisms uh, that uh, the wound ballistics uh, um, cover on how the injury is created. First, it's the direct uh, effect of the bullet. There's laceration and crushing of the tissue. And then there is the energy that makes the cavitation that's much, much larger than the diameter of the bullet. And that's when we see all these injuries. Um, there's that little uh, model there that shows that a, a 38 caliber round creates almost a three inch cavity uh, from, a, a, uh, from the bullet. Then uh, the shock wave is the final uh, impact that uh, can uh, also create a blast injury uh, that uh, even a crazed bullet can then really um, injure the brain or spinal cord. Um, the different velocities, the more the velocity, the flatter the bullet. Um, the um, pathway of the bullet is usually this uh, kind of a circular motion that is um, created from the, uh, the grooves and that allows the bullet to stay in its path. The longer the bullet, the more uh, mutation you have, which is uh, defined as the tip going on a circular motion. So the shorter the bullet, the more accurate it is, the less mutation. So uh, <laughs> the, the, the bottom line is that the guns are really, really lethal. Most gunshot wound victims never make it to the hospital. And out of the small percentage that make it to the hospital, never make it out of the hospital, uh, at least not in good condition. Um, the 30% the, the that enter the hospital emergency room alive, um, out of those patients, only very small fraction is uh, a surgical candidate and will receive some type of neurosurgical intervention. And we'll talk about a few patients that we've seen that did receive surgical intervention and some that we just managed uh, uh, by, by medical management. So uh, treating and attempts to treat gunshot wounds uh, goes all the way back to um, 1700 BC. And uh, the guidelines was then and almost similar to now is uh, not to go after the bullet. So Edwin Pappers said, if the wound penetrates the dura, it should not be treated. The outcomes are terrible. Um, in neurosurgical management, uh, we also, we do not chase the bullets. We take out what we can. We'll debris the wounds. We'll take out bullet fragments if they're easily accessible, or if they're in the scalp. Um, but really the main um, goal is to manage any kind of blood loss, make sure that we have um, uh, antibiotics and anti-epileptics on board. And we also um, uh, want to make sure that if there's any kind of uh, um, coagulopathy, we address that pretty quickly because that patients can bleed to death very, very quickly. Uh, most management for gunshot wound is a decompression. So we try to manage ICPs. We use ICP monitors, ventricular drains. And uh, if the ICPs become not manageable or if there's any kind of a mass effect that we see from a big blood clot, um, we 
can consider decompressive craniectomy. However, the patients that we see are oftentimes in very poor neurological condition. Um, what are the very bad markers for outcomes? Uh, if the GCS is less than five, if you have unresponsive pupils, also um, if you have uh, an injury that looks like what we see on the right there, uh, crossing multiple, multiple uh, hemispheres. So if you have a bihemispheric injury, the likelihood that you're gonna walk out of the hospital is almost zero. Um, there is uh, something called zona fatalis, uh, fatal zone of injury, which is um, located uh, a little bit above the cella, and uh, uh, that is a, uh, an area that would transfers, um, transfers through eloquent uh, um, brain areas, such as the thalami, and uh, if you have a bullet injury with multiple fragments uh, that you see that has that kind of a picture and a poor neurological exam, usually the management is, is not to do anything. So there's been attempts to classify um, craniocerebral injuries that started from World War I. Um, we've gotten most of our information and research from wartime injuries. So Harvey Cushing um, started this and then Matson who's the father's pediatric neurosurgery, um, uh, came up with the classifications that's still used that um, classifies the wounds from the more minor ones to the more severe ones. So we have scalp wounds, um, we have um, perforating through and through wounds, and then also what kind of complicating factors uh, we see with those uh, dural injuries, ventricular penetration, et cetera. So this is an example of a grazing wound. So this is when a bullet hits the head in an oblique angle and just sort of crazes the, the head. But these, you know, depending on what the caliber of the gun is, these can be really bad injuries. This is a kid that we just saw a um, couple of days ago came in. Um, I was driving home and I got one of these ring alerts uh, saying there's been a shooting in the neighborhood, and sure enough, a few hours later, get a call, and this is a, a CAT scan that's uh, 3D reconstructed to show you how the bullet goes in from uh, one side of the head and travels in the, uh, between the inner and the outer table of the bone and then comes out. Um, the CAT scan doesn't look so bad, but the kid didn't have any vision. So this, um, this bullet, created such a blast injury that it injured uh, both visual cortex and he could only see, be able to differentiate between light and dark, couldn't even count fingers. Um, we took out the superficial fragments of the bullet and you can see here in the suspectability weighted imaging um, MRI sequence that we have how much um, that blast had uh, injured the brain cortex. Uh, luckily, he's slowly getting better, and uh, he did not require any surgery. Penetrating wounds. So this is what um, is uh, uh, one of the most severe injuries. You have enough kinetic energy from the bullet to penetrate the skull, um, but the um, bullet ends up staying somewhere in the cranial cavity. Sometimes it can break into pieces and you have multiple pieces uh, um, transversing through. Um, the bone fragments can also be pushed in, um, causing more and more damage. The most serious one, this is a perforating wound and uh, the bihemispheric gunshot wounds here, as you can see from the pathology sample, are not something that um, are survivable. The 2% that made it uh, is not gonna be in good condition. So a couple of cases, recent cases. So we had a 10 year old boy who was playing outside his home, every mother's nightmare. Mom hears gunshots, goes outside, sees the kid on the ground. Kid is brought in um, by the police immediately to our emergency room where he's intubated. He's not following commands. He's bradycardic, hypotensive and hyperthermic. 
Um, initially, we said, oh, this is the luckiest kid in the world. You can see that there is a through and through injury, right? Um, at, at the level of the craniocervical junction, you see that all that air there in the uh, uh, CAT scan. And uh, he is uh, taken uh, and resuscitated, but does not wake up. So we proceed to do an MRI. And here you can see how badly the cerebellum was injured. So he went um, uh, directly to the OR after this scan and uh, uh, was, um, was uh, uh, um, resuscitated and made a fairly good recovery. Um, there's terrible, um, terrible injuries that can be caused by just spinal fluid leaking. This is uh, pneumocephalus from a spinal fluid leak in a baby. Here, um, blast injury from a bullet that entered into a, a thoracic spine of a boy. He couldn't move his legs after this. Um, nothing near the spinal canal, but just a blast from a high caliber bullet uh, took out his motor function. He slowly recovered uh, to a point that he was able to ambulate with the walker, but not perfect. So this is uh, our last case. This is actually a um, real headline there. Innocent bystander in an SUV was killed, and this boy was shot uh, right in the back of the head while walking home from school. He was brought in in a terrible neurological condition. He had uh, a GCS of T. After resuscitation, he wasn't doing anything. We were about to throw in the towel until we got a weak gag from him. And because he's a child and because I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon and a very optimistic, I said, we're gonna try to do something. We're taking this kid to the OR. And so we did. This is his scan. You can see terrible um, crushing injury here, taking out his sigmoid sinus. There are bullet fragments and bone fragments right next to this brain stem. This looks terrible. This is post-surgically. Uh, he received a ventricular drain, a big decompression, and Lord and behold, a couple of days later, he opened his eyes, and he is going to rehab on Monday. So sometimes, uh, you know, we get lucky and uh, we are able to pull somebody back from the brink of death, but it's usually not the case. Um, I just didn't want to end this presentation in a terrible, uh, totally depressing note, so I wanted to show you this miracle kid. Thank you, uh, Tina. That was really um, sobering, but very interesting and, and informative. Um, let's try to get some questions in. We don't have a whole lot of time. Um, so you said that with surgery, you don't go for all of the fragments, uh, either bone or bullet fragments. W then what's really the purpose of surgery? So the purpose of surgery is trying to salvage the brain tissue that's not injured. Um, because of the massive blast, there's usually associated swelling that can be so bad that in a closed cranial cavity, it'll be um, uh, uh, not, a, uh, not a good day. The ICPs will eventually creep up to the point that the patient will herniate. Uh, if we don't do surgery. So if the patient's salvageable and you see that there's uh, a lot of swelling that can't be controlled with medical management, um, you know, obviously you would have an ICP monitor in place, uh, then the, the surgery would be a decompression and trying to relieve some of that pressure and save the, the remainder of the brain. Do you see delayed infections in any of these patients because the fragments aren't removed or the, bo or the um, bone fragments aren't removed? So yeah, they are all high risk for infections. Um, a lot of the times though, the bullets are so hot that they are sterile going in. So they, um, uh, we, we don't see as much infections as we would see in a penetrating low velocity injury, like a knife in the head or an ax in the head. Um, but uh, everybody gets antibiotic prophylaxis and uh, anti-seizure prophylaxis as well because they have very high incidence of seizures. Um, that's, that's about all we have time for. I apologize for those people I didn't get to, to answer their questions. Uh, again, Dr. Levin, that was, that was really, it was a wonderful talk, very informative. And um, 
I'm not sure I am comfortable now walking in the dark. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so this concludes our formal lectures. If the audience could give us roughly five minutes to set up for our next panel discussion, which is going to be very exciting. It's uh, a group of experts essentially answering questions so the audience can ask us any questions and we will field all questions. So give us about five minutes. Thank you.